moderate the, la the last panel, but she chickened out. <laughs> and, uh, I got stuck with it. Uh, so this is 2000 to the present and beyond. And actually, we're going to probably try to focus most of our attention on the present and beyond. Uh, kind of what are the current situations that we're facing uh, politically, economically, education, et cetera, et cetera. And then we're going to spend as much time as we can talking about the beyond. This panel is a group of people that are focused on the beyond and are doing work, serious work, in addressing the issues of how do we deal with the current issues that we have in this community and how do we uh, really concretely identify what our vision is and work together to, to go get it. Uh, so I think I want to start with a group that has been dealing with a number of issues, heavy issues in this community for a long time, and it's been done by mostly high school students. The work has been done mostly by high school students. And that is Yucca. Uh, and they are currently engaged in some work around some extremely important stuff that's, that we have to project into the future, but the work they've done in the past, so I want uh, to start with Yucca, uh, Ophelia, and then um, I think Lisa, maybe next, she's probably been uh, engaged in this a, a little bit longer than the other uh, panel members. But uh, Tunde has one of the most exciting programs, I think, in the country, in the nation, the street code. And they are doing uh, a whole bunch of different things. But he's also engaged in other discussions around how do we deal with the things like the housing issues and so forth. Uh, Stephen DeBerry, who I met a couple of years ago, and I call the ultimate entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Steven. <laughs> I don't think I've ever met anybody as young as Stephen that is engaged in as much stuff as Stephen is. And uh, so every time I am uh, honored to be in his presence and have a conversation, I'm just amazed at uh, not only his, his intellect, but his, just his raw energy and uh, his insight and just belief that I can make anything happen. And Regina, I met her first with the uh, Obama campaign and had a, went to her house for a number of different meetings and was extremely impressed with her, not only her ability to organize stuff, but her ability to just make people do stuff. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, I am, uh, and of course you all know Lisa is the mayor, and she's been tough enough to hang on and struck, stick it out and work for, what is this, your second term yes. in, uh, on the council? So, uh, anyone who can do that for two or three terms has got to be tough. <laughs> so, I'm honored to be sitting up here with this group and excited to hear uh, what they have to say, and uh, so I want to start with uh, Ophelia and uh, have her to talk about uh, some of the things that uh, Yuba has done over the years, but to also focus on what they're engaged in now and uh, what the uh, thinking is in terms of future. Thank you. Um, okay, I don't think I need to hold this. I'm projecting very clearly, right? Okay, um, so my name is Ophelia Bello. Thank you so much um, 
Mr. Hoover, for inviting you to this panel. Uh, we're really excited to be able to share our voice, our wins, and kind of our strategy moving forward um, for future decades. Um, my I, I mentioned my name is Ophelia Bello, right? <laughs> my name is Ophelia Bello, um, and just for the formal introduction, I know all of this is being documented, which we're super excited about. Um, once again, I'm the executive director of YUCA, or Youth United for Community Action. Um, there are a couple things that I wanted to touch on uh, in regards to everything Yuka. Um, our previous wins uh, since the 90s, and then kind of where we're headed now. So first I wanted to touch on uh, some of the wins that Yuka has engaged in over the years and start with a little bit of history just to kind of contextualize uh, where we are now. So in in 1994 is uh, when Yuka established itself as a nonprofit, kind of formally, but um, we were kind of born from uh, Mama Keisha and Peter Evans' kind of work and bringing youth along in what was, at the time, the biggest um, environmental justice fight happening in the city. I think some of you all, if not all of you all, might remember that uh, Romic used to operate in East Palo Alto. And it was what we refer to at Yuka, a, a delinquent kind of business organization that operated without a permit <coughs> for uh, so many years. Um, it was toxic to its employees, uh, not only to its employees, but to the residents of East Palo Alto, right? Um, I heard a little bit in the last panel, we were talking about kind of the importance of having a political voice. Um, having a political voice at the table representing the best interest of the residents of East Palo Alto. And since uh, since Romic was operating before East Palo Alto was incorporated as a city, there was a lot of shady things going on that didn't quite get approved or um, that East Palo Alto residents weren't in the know about um, and that dragged along for a while. So in with the mentorship of Mama Keisha, Peter Evans, and other um, community members, community organizers that had been picking this fight, um, battling, battling the struggle unapologetically um, in the 90s and, and prior to that, uh, the youth came to the table and were saying, how can we help? How do we plug into the very important struggles that are happening, East Palo, happening in East Palo Alto? And how can we carry the weight, um, like also share a weight in this big uh, struggle? So. Um, in, in 1994, uh, like I mentioned, Yuka was, uh, became a formal nonprofit organization and continued that fight uh, against Romic. And it was a beautiful intergenerational struggle with uh, elders, uh, young people, college age students, and then young people as young as 12, 13, like very young. Um, and it wasn't until 2007, a good amount of years later, and fairly recently, looking back now, that Romic was shut down. And that was all thanks to the work that uh, this interge intergenerational coalition of community organizers had relentlessly been fighting over the years. Um, and it was partially because of that struggle that we engaged in from the jump that Yuka formed as an environmental justice coalition, or an environmental justice uh, organization. And since then, we've also taken on issues around housing, around jobs, around um, abuse, uh, poli abuse of police power, police brutality, and uh, the Black Lives Matter struggle that was born, uh, that kind of <coughs> got fire underneath it in the last few years. Um, probably most prominently in the 2014, I believe, killing of uh, the late Mike Michael Brown. Um, so since then, Yuka has been involved in uh, continuous environmental justice struggles that kind of have taken the form of a lot of water work. Um, in 2011, I want to say roughly in that in that time frame, um, the west side, the most dense population or the most dense uh, neighborhood in town, the west side area, was seeing really high levels of manganese in their water. And since then, Yuka began investigating uh, what the source of that was, continue to organize around water quality issues, um, and has been engaging in that struggle also for a good amount of years. If that began in 2011, and we still were working on it last year, that's roughly five, six years. Um, and the other topic, or the other kind of um, 
super important struggle that Yuka, that Yuka has been engaged in is the housing, uh, the housing issue. In East Palo Alto and in the broader Bay Area, we can see and um, I thought it was really powerful to, it captures me every time when I see the changing demographics in East Palo Alto, and of course there have been different forces at play there, um, but Yuka has relentlessly also been working on housing justice, um, on the in the housing justice arena for some years now, and that has looked like protecting uh, and advocating for tenants, um, renters here in East Palo Alto, and advocating for strong rent stabilization laws, just cause eviction laws, and against uh, landlord harassment. Uh, as you all might know, in 2011-ish, also in the 2010-11, um, in that time frame, there were uh, predatory, there was a really large predatory land um, landlord also in the west side that owned a lot of those apartments, a huge stock of those apartments. And there's a lot of power in owning in owning units, right? In owning people's um, housing. And they were abusing that power in a number of ways. So Yuka became really heavily involved in, in advocating for tenants, um, advocating for, like I mentioned, strong just cause, rent stabilization uh, policies. And that work continues today because that work is never done. So um, with the high pressures or immense pressures of Silicon Valley and all of our affluent cities around us, that has been, um, it's been necessary to continue in that struggle. So those are a few of the wins and kind of the, some of the campaigns that Yuka has engaged in, or the big ones at least. There are many more that um, Yuka has been engaged in over the last few years. Um, and I also wanted to touch on the fact that Yuka is, has from the start been this uh, multiracial, multi-ethnic, um, multilingual organization. Uh, one of our, our first executive director was Chris Hayashi, a student out of uh, Stanford University who was in those conversations with uh, Mama Keisha and Peter Evans around what the youth could do to um, contribute to this struggle for, to shut down Romic and to get these environmental justice wins. And it, that has continued, that multiracial, multiethnic, multilingual, that spirit of organizing in Yuka has continued. I think over the years as um, our demographics have shifted and there has been a influx of Latinx populations here in town, um, has not changed at all the necessity to continue to center um, the struggles and the kind of voice of black residents and kind of work at the core against um, anti-blackness, anti-racism in our communities. Um, because just by virtue of being a multiracial, multi-ethnic organization doesn't mean um, that all is well and that there aren't kind of differences that are beautiful and that need to be um, honored. It means that we continue to work in those multiracial, multi-ethnic ways and kind of across uh, race and ethnicity and language to organize our working class residents and organize against these big powers that have really an obscene amount of resources at their fingertips around us in Silicon Valley. So just wanted to kind of touch on that as well and mention how at Yuka, one of our, we have a number of activists, organizers, both local and international that uh, that decorate all of our walls inside of Yuka. Anyone, and I invite you all to come by and visit 2135 Clark Avenue, um, a humble but really powerful space where youth continue to collaborate and organize out of. And you'll see that a lot of our walls are decorated with a lot of these icons that are um, local, like I mentioned, regional, or I mean, sorry, national and international. One of whom is our beloved Miss Asata Shakur. Um, we have her, uh, we have this beautiful painting of her that hangs right above one of our doorways into the hallway. And I get, I'm pretty impressed with how often I hear our youth organizers cite her um, in, in different ways. And one of the things that we kind of continue, continuously remember at Yuka is that <coughs> Asata Shakur was a huge advocate for uh, the working class, for 
uh, people who had less than the very rich, very well endowed uh, folks at the tippy top of the economic spectrum, I'll say. And she also acknowledged the need to organize um, across class despite race, despite ethnicity. So it's really powerful to see the youth really um, kind of channel Asata Shakur and hearing them, overhearing their campaign meetings, uh, which they run themselves and which are youth led uh, day in and day out. Um, but it's really beautiful to see the spirit of, of uh, these iconic organizers and activists who we, who we think of today as um, really powerful and having influenced our work in the self-determination and creation of East Palo Alto, still being carried forward today by 11th, uh, 10th, 10th, 11th, 12th graders, and as young as 8th graders. We have a couple of 12-year-old, 13-year-old um, youth organizers at UCA. So um, in terms of the way we move forward, we know that there are a lot of forces kind of encroaching on East Palo Alto from the housing side, from the economic side, like the generation of jobs uh, all around us in Silicon Valley. And yet, throughout the years, we haven't quite uh, prospered in the same way as our neighbors. Um, we still take all of that into account. We take uh, our values and our principles as organizers, interge intergenerational, multi-ethnic, multiracial organizers um, in this organization. and know that we have um, a long way to go, but Yuka, um, just to finish off, Yuka is an organization that for as long as it's existed has implemented the seven generations model, which means that when we organize, we are forward, look, we are forward thinking and um, only want to engage in transformative things that keep in mind that we want the seventh generation ahead of us, seven generations ahead of us, to benefit from the work that we're doing today. And that's having a lot of vision for the youth to implement that Monday through Friday um, and sometimes on the weekends. It's really powerful to see and kind of pushes me to be the best leader and the best director I can and kind of empowering them. Um, and to be honest, they make my work very easy. These youth are super powerful. They'll be at city council meetings. They'll be at school board meetings and articulate really complex information in a very digestible way and that's when you know that they're learning um, they're learning the issues of, of East Palo Alto and are able to teach them back to their other youth peers and um, are kind of holding their own in these conversations with our elders and our uh, just older community organizers that also are the majority of the folks who show up to city council meetings who are in this work so yeah, thank you. We're super grateful for um, many of the people who are here today. Uh, and of course, Uncle Bob, uh, which the youth continue to kind of affectionately refer to him as, for continuing to empower us, to give us um, a strong foundation for us to build on, and for letting us say confidently that when we organize in the city of East Palo Alto, we're truly standing on the shoulders of giants. So mm -hmm. thank you. All right, well, all of y'all know I'm really partial to uh, youth organizations, and so Yuga is um, close to my heart. I love what they're doing, and uh, I'm amazed at what, even though I've been around kids for uh, 60 years now, uh, at what uh, children and kids can do if we give them an opportunity. All right, uh, next is uh, Lisa. And what's the question? Huh? Fill me in the question. What am I saying? Oh. What am I saying? Uh, just, well, one is to talk about what the issues that we face as a, as a community now and uh, some thoughts about what you would like to see happen in terms of how we address those issues over the next Sure, years. sure. So again, I just want to thank the organizers of this event. It is so important. And please forgive my casual dress. Um, I think it's so important that we have a community calendar because in addition to this awesome event, there's a group of young people who grew up in East Palo Alto who are playing softball at Jack Farrell Park, and they're the people who look like us that should be in this room learning about our history, and we're missing that opportunity, so that's something that we need to work on to get a true community calendar that, so that everybody can show up in one place. Um, a 
through you. Thank you for your words. It's um, so inspiring to see the work that Yuka is doing. And when we think about Yuka, before I move forward, I still think there needs to be a study in East Palo Alto to really analyze the damage that, you, that Romic did. Um, because we have a lot of cancer in our community and where is that cancer coming from? If we could have an environmental study that will show us is it coming from the environmental um, uh, residue that happened with Romic, but we need to know where the cancer clusters are and how we can, can work with that. So again, my name is Lisa yarbrough Goshe. I'm a longtime resident of this city. I am honored to be in the leadership role um, within my community. Um, Uncle Bob, I appreciate yesterday, um, it was like sitting at the feet of my elders and learning about the history of our city. And I'm going to say that I don't think anybody else should be able to run for council on this, in this great city without knowing mm -hmm. their history. Mm -hmm. Because it's so important to understand the work that you've done and all the, all the things that you've done. Um, what's facing our city? Um, yeah, well, the group. <laughs> you know, you mentioned Stokely Carmichael. You were talking about big giants. It was, there are people that I read about in history that were here in East Palo Alto. You rub shoulders with those individuals, so that's historical, and that's a lot of information that all of us don't know. But again, going back to being in the leadership role here in East Palo Alto, um, what's facing us? We know that housing is something that's so important. Um, transportation in our community is, is, is something else. And traffic, just getting through the city is very difficult on any given day around time to commuting time to get through. So those are some of the things that are important, some of the things that we've been working on. We were very proud to say that uh, we were able to bring water into the community so that we can uh, continue to develop the community. Um, in order to, to develop the, the, the community, um, the council worked with some of our developers, and, we ha and we're working with a lot of development. Right now we have development pressure that's coming into the city to, to um, bring on that work that is taking place, and we have to think about the development that comes in. We, we need some development to help us to maintain our role as leaders and to give us the revenue that will allow us to provide the services that we need. But as this, this development comes forward, we need to think about how it's going to impact the traffic, how it's going to impact us. When I think about our history, Uncle Bob, I want to go back to that. Um, my mother uh, moved us here in 1967, and in the 70s, um, um, through the, the efforts of Caldwell bankers or the realtors, my mother was able to buy a house in the gardens. And it's because of that work and those, the leadership in, in those days where we were a real community, where we helped each other out, we didn't forget who your neighbors were, and there was a true effort to make sure that residents of East Palo Alto had housing. And right now, we're struggling to keep people in our community because it's not affordable. I remember when East Palo Alto was affordable. And it was a couple of years ago that there was an article that was written um, about East Palo Alto, and it said, East Palo Alto, the last affordable city, and I almost lost my mind. I was like, why are we broadcasting the fact that we're affordable? <laughs> because from that point on, we were no longer affordable. Um, and with that, with that, if you weren't in a position where <coughs> if you weren't able to purchase your home, now you're feeling the pressure of everybody else eyeing this wonderful community that's in a great location. Um, and as we work with that, and as we see people move into the community, I think I would like to say one of the biggest challenges that I, we have, I, I, and I'm sure you have your own vision, but is how do we bring East Palo Alto together and not lose East Palo Alto? I don't know if you've been somewhere, been around, and you know East Palo Alto has a personality of its own. We are a city unlike any other city in the Bay Area because we have, at the time we became a city, county gave us lemons. This city has been working hard to make lemonade out of what we've been given ever since. And I'm so proud of the efforts of those individuals who came before me to make it possible. Where are we going in the future? We need to make sure that we continue to work towards housing, but more importantly, we need to talk about education and how we're gonna make sure that the individuals who are in our community are educated and have access to the jobs that are making a difference that are going to allow them to stay here. Not only that, we need to figure out finances. So because if you're going to be able to buy a home, you have to have somebody that's going to be able or be willing to give us loans. And right now, I think there's a struggle with 
how do you get loans? Not only how do you get loans, how do you afford a house in East Palo Alto and make it work? So I know there's some work that's coming forward to bring affordable housing. How do we make sure that we're at the table and have opportunities? And how do we coexist <coughs> in the city that is here and make sure that we're not leaving other people out? I don't know if I've answered your question right. completely. Yeah. But Thank you. Yes. Tunde's last name came from, but I want to hear that. But um, I met Tunde a couple of years ago uh, through Living Peace, and I have been uh, just enthralled with his energy and his intelligence, his, his ability to communicate with anybody, everybody, and especially young people. And when I see their street code thing, with they got a, a lot of kids, seven, eight, nine years old, that are turning out absolutely amazing high-tech things. I just uh, am just thrilled every time I'm around him or I see the work that he's doing. So, well, tune day. Thank you, Uncle Bob. I'm humble, um, especially coming from you. I'm uh, extremely humble to be on this panel. Um, I echo the gratitude of Ophelia um, and Mary Lisa uh, just to be able to be in this room. Um, it's gonna be hard for me to put all my thoughts together, so let me make my first tribute um, to my beautiful wife who's over there. Her name is Tamara. Um, and she's already texting me notes. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> if I say something that edifies you, um, thank her. Uh, my children um, who are here, all four of them, Tayo, Temilola, Tatiola, and Ola Taye, um, they're here. They're all Yoruba names. Um, my father, and I have to thank you on his behalf, who came here when he was 18 years old um, from Nigeria. My name is Ola Tunde Shabomahin, and he came um, here uh, for education with the intention to go back to his homeland. And he married my mom, um, who is a white American, who based on her childhood, um, had a heart to, uh, to you know, make the world more equitable, especially given her faith. And they went back when I was one years old. And given the political turmoil of Nigeria, we're not able to stay in safety. And so they, they came back and we bounced around eventually landed in Portland. And I mean, I, I guess one could say that, you know, those seeds, obviously, of my mother and my father um, were inside myself, inside all my three brothers um, who I grew up with. And so when I came here in 1998, my desire to be part of a community who thought about justice, who thought about making the world better, um, was still in me. And I remember I was living in Ujima, and at that time, East Palo Alto had a reputation that it was that, that it was a community that was talking about justice, that was talking about equity. And they didn't tell me the fraction of what I've come to know, but it was enough uh, for me to take a class. And the first person I met that talked about technology equity was Mookie. And you just heard from him, the brilliance that this brother just dropped in four and a half minutes can become our thesis at Streetco. It is our goal um, now to do what Mookie just laid out in four and a half minutes. Um, and so that was the first person I saw I plugged in. I took a class. And for me, as Mookie mentioned, that was that was like it was like normal. And the, and the next class I took, or soon thereafter, I was scribing for Dr. Omawali Satterwhite, who was leading, at the time, the Neighborhood Improvement Initiative, working out of the, out of the cafeteria of Chavez, bringing together hundreds of people to work on these issues. I was not allowed to say a word. I was a Stanford student. And for some reason, y'all would 
dog and stamp students at the back. So all I could do was just take out a pen and pad and scribe. But it gave me insight into the the vision, right? I, I didn't I didn't know the totality. I'm still unpacking it. But you saw little glimpses of the self-determination. You saw glimpses of we're gonna do whatever we could do. Mama Tiambe, I still remember, it probably was 19 years ago. She was sitting behind me at Kresge Auditorium with a host of students that she had brought for a speaker. Um, you talk about take back the mic, Dr. Omawali's name comes up. Decades later, I'm at the footsteps of Bob Hoover and he's talking about the pressures of the economy. This is years ago, people mentioned he was talking about this in the 70s. But these are the, these are the moments why on behalf of my mom, why on behalf of my father, why on behalf of my brothers and on behalf of my family, I have to say thank you so much for the vision of this Nairobi, for the people's movement that made it. You know, my wife comes from Dallas, South Dallas. With what we pay for rent, we could buy a house on her block. I come from Portland, Oregon. My family's still there. But there's something about being part of a city that was created on the grounds of equity that would make that would draw you back. I believe it was Sister Vicky who said if people would sleep in a car to be close to this. The, the draw that I'm sure draws all of us here for two days and staying late is the same draw that drew me back. So I'm just saying all that to say thank you. Um, I don't take it lightly what you've done. Uh, in my mind, right, I came in came in '98 asking the question like, what does civil rights look like? Um, Dr. Mawali said at the time, you know, you had to choose Dr. King and Malcolm X. He chose Malcolm X. I had chose Dr. King at the time, <laughs> and so I was looking at Dr. King, you know, saying like, Lord, I want to go to Morehouse and and really stumbled upon um, Stanford. But I was with that question, um, and so. I was, I was, I'm just so grateful to see that there's a legacy built that from which um, I now get to uh, have my family be a part of it. So I'm, for that, I'm very grateful. Um, this relates partial to the extension of that part of, to the extension of that story, but also speaks to why I'm doing something at at Street Code. Um, Mookie, who I, I, I would donate you know, whatever I could to see him continue his work um, in this community, spoke um, a lot about his own relationship with technology. He's a technologist, I'm, I'm not, um, but I'm doing something called Street Code Academy, uh, which is bringing technology access and technology exposure um, to this community and, and other communities of color. And the reason, why I, the reason why I found that as a passion, which I still believe is true, is because then you guys, you guys said you all as East Palo Alto already knew that and plugged in and was already doing that uh, with the One East Palo Alto Initiative. Um, I believe it was, I forgot the name of it, uh, forgive me, but th there was a digital digital village um, that was years ago, pr all pre uh, Street Code Academy. But what I learned in 1998, really by way of Jesse Jackson, who had come here by the works of Plugged In, was that digital divide was, was, a, was a civil rights issue of our era. And we coined it in this phrase. We just took a group of us to, to Selma, Alabama, and we, 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 we walked across the Evan Pettus Bridge, um, which at the time people sacrificed some lives and certainly their safety for us to have the right to vote. And at that moment, what Selma believed and, with, and, and really so many black people um, believed and others that the right to vote was gonna give us access to our future. Well, Jesse Jackson was saying, with the right to vote, freedom from slavery, um, you know, in, in, in large, in the desegregation, freedom from segregation, you really needed economic empowerment. And what was gonna give you access to economic empowerment was technology. That was the, that was the tool that was gonna give us the tools for, that, that, was, that was the vehicle that was gonna give us the tools to access economic opportunity. So I was just this young person who cared about social equity now trying to wrestle with technology. 
And I tried to do it back then, and we weren't able to be as successful as a plugged in. Um, who I still remember the program, it was a, and it was an award-winning youth program, and they were doing websites based on youth culture. Yes. We, we weren't able to do that. I, I tried to do that in my hometown, and it was unsuccessful. People cared about basketball, they cared about fashion, they cared about you know making money. And so we were unsuccessful in doing that. So I, I started another company, I started other things to try to get the same social progress, but about five years ago, um, a group of us, including Living Peace, which, um, uh, um, which Bob Hoover mentioned, a group of us were able to resurface this idea that had been there years ago, um, but to look at, can we bridge the talent of East Palo Alto with the opportunities that surround us? And you, we were, Silicon Valley, the rest of Silicon Valley was really able to take folks and bring them into the top one, one, one tenth percentile of wealth Right, wealth was it was accelerating everywhere outside. It was I love you. <laughs> First of all, I love this community. I love the people in this room, and that's why I'm here. I moved here in. Let's see. I first came to the Bay Area in 1997, and I had been living in Australia working on a business. <coughs> And I literally had not seen another black person for over a year. And I came here to work at a research lab uh, for Paul Allen, the guy that started and co-founded Microsoft. And I didn't know the Bay Area at all. Um, I, I was looking for housing from Australia. And so I bought a place in Palo Alto uh, because that's where the office was that I was working. And when I came here, I realized that on the other side of the freeway were all my people. And so I've rapidly started saving my chips, and it took me a little while, but eventually I had enough to buy a home here with my folks. So I am, I am, that's why I'm so grateful to be here today, um, because it feels like home. It is home. Um, but, I, but I also think about what I saw as someone who did not know the Bay Area, didn't understand the social geography of this place, and was just parachuting in. And one of the things that was particularly perverse to me was the, the division that I saw with the 101 freeway. Because, you know, I landed from Australia. I went from the airport. Well, first of all, they said Silicon Valley. I was looking for the valley. I didn't see that. <laughs> but I saw on the west side of the freeway, you know, the idyllic streets and the trees and all this and that. And I saw, you know, what was happening on our side of the freeway on the east side. And it just didn't make sense to me. Um, and it's those initial observations that really inform everything, <clears throat> everything that I'm doing in business still today, almost 20 years later. Um, I think about, you know, so Uncle Bob was talking about the fact that um, I've been working on some, some land uh, development here in the city. Um, and I think there, I want to share a, a little story um, related to that that I think highlights a much broader dynamic that we're all dealing with in this conversation about where we are today and where we're going. I think if you were to fast forward 100 years from now and you were kind of like me, just dropping in, maybe you're an alien, you don't know anything about this place and you looked at the economic disparity, the educational disparity, access to water, any number of things, in the moment that we're in, in human history, again, as an anthropologist, I've been looking at us as a species and how we've developed. We have never built as much wealth or built wealth as fast as we have been over the last 20 years in Silicon Valley. That's an economic fact, okay? And so with that as a fact, if you were an alien 100 years from now doing the archaeology and trying to understand this community you didn't know anything about, and you saw the kind of disparity that we face, you know, with these separations like we have with the freeway, it wouldn't make any sense. And your work as a, as a, as a future anthropologist, archaeologist, would be difficult because the things that drive those disparities are often <clears throat> invisible. 
So let me give you an example. Um, about three years ago, there was a period where residential property prices in East Palo Alto went up 75% in 18 months. Okay. I don't have to explain that because we feel it. This is our neighborhood, right? You know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. At the same time, commercial big buildings, business buildings, those prices also spiked. And they spiked all around the Bay Area. But during that period, there were essentially no new commercial buildings built in East Palo Alto. That would be part of your challenge as the future archaeologist, try to make sense of this. How can it be that in the middle of the largest economic inflection point in human history, we've never grown as much or as fast as we have over the last couple decades. How can it be that everyone around us is growing except East Palo Alto? And I wondered that for years. And I finally figured it out because a friend of mine was running the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. And one day, he ran it down to me. He explained that in 1980, there was a meeting of almost all the municipalities in the nine county Bay Area. I picture it like the, the five families meeting in The Godfather, you know? And in that meeting, the municipalities decided who would get how much water, okay? And East Palo Alto got a paltry allocation of water. And so fast forward to this period that I was talking about where everything's booming around us. Everybody's building, everybody's growing. Not just technology, but real estate, but us. And why is that not happening here? And again, it's hard to divine this stuff because it's invisible. But the reason is that East Palo Alto was over its water allocation. So I can tell you from a real estate development, the practical constraint was you couldn't build a building because you can't get water, you can't get fire sprinklers, and so you can't get a, a new building approved. And that is a result that was impeding our economic growth in this city over the last couple of years based on a decision that happened in 1980. And it's invisible. Who sees that? Nobody sees that kind of stuff, unless you just nerd on those issues for years, like I do. These are the kinds of nuanced and invisible challenges that we're facing. The good news is we understood that there now has been a water uh, agreement in place with our neighboring cities, who, by the way, had a surplus of water, which is ironic because among the nine county Bay areas, guess who is the most efficient per capita user of water? East Palo Alto. So when we talk about environmentalism and efficiency and everything, we are the leader who benefit, who's participating in that. And we have an opportunity to radically redesign that. And that's happening now. And I think that's a challenge before this community. I also think that have you guys developed a system to get some more people of color, uh, uh, some type of program to get ownership? Stick with that for a second. I'll come back to that. Um, I think I want to build on what Tunde was talking about. Um, because black and brown folks are on the extreme low end of participation in the technology industry and the technology economy broadly. And so one of the things that I've dedicated myself to is impacting that, not directly from the point of view of technology, but I've, I've done that in the past. In fact, I've started multiple companies from my home here on Mouton Circle. Um, but we're facing massive structural issues that I don't think we can solve purely with, you know, by inventing new apps or you know, technology products. That's necessary but it's not sufficient. We have to be participating in the flows of capital. Who's moving the money to drive the tech to the places we want it to go? And so 10 years and a couple months ago, I started also from that same house on Mouton Circle, an investment firm called Bronze Investments. 
And we are in the business of investing. You know, most investment firms have, a, have an investment thesis. Ours is an east side investment thesis. Everything that we do at Bronze Investments is about closing the gap between haves and have-nots. Because in the same way the divider for us here is the freeway, it is a fractal. Our, our structural dynamic exists you know, in so many other places. So East Palo Alto is East Oakland, and East LA, and East Philly, and New Orleans East, and the east side of Detroit, and East Cleveland, and East St. Louis. I can go on, right? You get the point. And it's no accident that there are these similarities. And so we have to build investment strategies that enable us to drive capital into our communities and rebuild in ways that are gonna lift up our own folks. I wanna give just two examples of the kinds of things that we're investing in. Because what we're trying to do is go really big and try to chip away at the decades of, of structural marginalization you know, that, that puts us in the position that we're in. So, you know, one example is the fact that if you're, you're here in EPA, it's hard to find a place to eat with a knife and fork. You look at the Ravenswood Shopping Center, and it's mostly, I mean, everybody's nodding their head. You know the story. You got Taco Bell, you got Pizza Hut, you got McDonald's, right? If you want to eat with a knife and fork, maybe you can go to the Quattro restaurant in the Four Seasons on the west side of the freeway, or you can go to Ikea Cafeteria. But otherwise, you're buying food from places that are driving diabetes. And you do the math. As of uh, three years ago, in this country, we were spending $300 billion a year fighting diabetes. And I say fighting because the way we deal with diabetes is to give you an uh, insulin prescription, which does not reverse diabetes. It manages diabetes. And I will tell you, that $300 billion number from three years ago, I got new data this week. You know what the number is today? $404 billion a year. In, 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 in three years, it went from 300 to $404 billion a year, okay? And because it's a fractal, all these east side communities, we have the same restaurants. That's why they're growing so big, right? Same problem. So my investment firm has invested in a company called Verta. Uh, the reversal rate for type 2 diabetes, the standard of care, if you go to the doctor and say, well, what's the likelihood I can reverse this? It's 0.4%. So round that, it's zero. You can't do it, is what they will tell you. This company has a third party peer review, several published papers showing 60, 60% reversal rate. The goal of the company is to reverse diabetes in 100 million people by 2025. These are the kinds of businesses I think we should be investing in. Ones that can grow profitably, you do the math on that, that is a multi-billion dollar company most likely. But because it, it has a product that is serving a condition that over indexes for our people, the, the positive impact over indexes for our people. That's the business that I want to do. And that's the work that Bronze Investments is doing. I've got another company that built its first prototype here, and I won't spend too much time on that, but it's, you know, it's working to drop the cost of housing construction because we basically build buildings the same way we have for the last 100 years. And with all this innovation and technology developing, there's no excuse for that. There's got to be a better way. And so this company is using you know, robotics and machinery and computer vision and, and modern uh, construction techniques with the goal of radically driving the price down. Because if we can get the construction cost down, what we can do is deliver housing to our folks in a more affordable way without appealing to government subsidy and all, all the programs that are, are the current regime of how these things get financed. So those are the kinds of things that we're investing in. And as we think about the way forward for East Palo Alto and East Side communities generally, 
I want to make one last comment, um, which starts by celebrating the fact that we're coming together. And I think I know how proud I am to be part of this conversation and to build on what the Nairobi movement started. And as I told Uncle Bob, I view it as a relay. You all have done so much important work for so long. And I think it's time for us now, mm -hmm. some of the young bucks, mm -hmm. buck essence, to <laughs> take the baton and run with what you've built. You've built such a strong and amazing foundation. And we need to continue with that. And I want to just make a, a quick comment about what we have to build with. Because I think m most of the work that we do as it relates to taking care of our communities is done through nonprofits. Most of the lifeblood of nonprofits comes from foundations. Okay? If you aggregate all of the foundation assets in the United States, and we know not all foundations are checking for us, first of all, but let's just say they were. All the foundation assets, all the endowment assets of all the foundations across all of the United States, that number is $890 billion. That's the pool we have to, to work with if we imagine that everyone actually wanted us to be free, which we know they don't. Okay? I saw some math recently. It was at a, a, a meeting in New Mexico a first of its kind meeting where a group of donors of color came together, multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multilingual, like Ophelia was talking about. And they were doing the intro for this meeting and they put some numbers up because they had done a bunch of research on uh, donors of color and their giving practices. And I saw a number on one slide, I saw a number on another slide, and they hadn't put these two numbers together and I was taking my notes and you know, just doing some math and trying to think about what they were talking about. Here are the two numbers that stuck with me. Really simple. Two million donors of color in the United States are stewards of at least a million dollars. Are you blown away? Not yet, right? Let me explain why that is an amazing number. Two numbers. Two million times one million is two trillion dollars. That's two trillion dollars controlled right now by people of color in the United States. Remember I told you all the foundation endowment <coughs> assets aggregated is $890 billion. What I'm trying to tell you is that people of color are already twice the size of philanthropy. We have the wealth. It's a sham that people try to make us think that we're not wealthy. It's a sham that we even participate in this dialogue about the 1% because we live in an $18 trillion GDP economy. 70% of our, our economy is consumer spending. Even if you're the 1%, you're not most of the economy. Most of the economy is us buying tires and TVs and milk and gas and all that. So if we actually open our minds and start to think about what we have to work with, we will realize that we're already wealthy, y'all. You preaching. So <laughs> it's what we have to do is harvest what we've got, because we already have enough. And that's where I think our path is headed forward. Okay. All right. Last, but certainly not least. <laughs> I feel like I should wait quietly for, for, for permission to speak. A sister that, uh, as I told you earlier, I met with, uh, in, in, a, in a reference to a, uh, the, uh, to uh, Brother Obama's candidacy for a second term. And uh, of course, she decided to run for the city council here in East Palo Alto. And 
has just kind of overwhelmed me with uh, the things that she's thinking about, talking about, and uh, her analytical ability. So I am uh, pleased and honored to have her on this panel and to with us this evening. Thank you. You got, you got the floor. Okay. <laughs> so I. <laughs> Thank you for that. I, uh, I always feel like I need to uh, introduce myself in every room because I am not a native of the city of East Palo Alto. And undoubtedly, I walk into um, a room and someone says, who is that? Who is she? Why is she talking anyway? So my residency in the city began in 2002. But my relationship with East Palo Alto began in 1992. That was the year that I started as a freshman at Stanford University. Uh, for those who know me well, you know that I am a, a member of Delta Sigma Theta, which is a service sorority. And one of the criteria for admission is that you demonstrate that you are working in active service to your community prior to being admitted into the sorority. And that is for everyone, regardless of whether you are legacy, meaning you have family members who came before you or not, um, you work in service. And so for me, uh, the place that I felt most comfortable working in service to my community was in the city of East Palo Alto. Why? Uh, I was born in South Central California. My husband was born in the South Side of Chicago. And for us, although we don't have an East Side narrative, we have South Side narratives. <laughs> We very Can much. Can I jump in on that real quick? I, I, let me just explain. I was, also, I was born on the south side of Chicago. If you look at the south side on the map, it's actually the east side. If you went, <laughs> also a fact. If you went any further east, you would be in Lake, Lake Michigan. That's true. For, for us, um, as I listen to the narratives of the 80s and the 90s here, not just today, but Every day I sup with my fellow East Palo Altans. Um, what it reminds me of was what life was like in our own cities, in Chicago and in Los Angeles. Much of those experiences were very similar, um, particularly uh, the mass infusion of drugs and gang culture inside of our cities. Um, and the sheer determination of many of our parents uh, who, to my mind, are very reflective of the parents and the families who were part of the, of the Nairobi movement to, to put a shield of protection around their children so that they could survive. And I remember um, very, very clearly, I, I, I was frequently in Catholic schools, none of which my parents could afford. Their stance um, as a child was, we will eat beans so that you can make it. And um, my husband's parents, his mother lives with us to this day, I adore her. She was an office worker, and he was, uh, which is uh, office keeper, uh, which I roughly equivalent to a housekeeper, except she cleaned offices. And together, his parents made $40,000, which was not very much. They were sort of mutually codependent on each other. And she tells stories today about how um, she laid down and she had him, and she felt like it was uh, her obligation to make sure that he thrived. Um, and so as I look on the parents and the families and the community that makes up the Nairobi movement, it very much feels like an extension of my own. Uh, when I got here, the service that I started with in the 90s was uh, the Shule School. Uh, I also spent a fair amount of time tutoring at the Montessori School right behind um, uh, St. Francis. Francis Church, thank you. And um, I also helped to clean the Bell Street Community Center before it turned into a different space. Um, I also remember helping to build 
um, the Habitat homes right behind McDonald's. And um, for those who have been talking about plugged in, I don't know if you remember Kaigani Turner. He, is, uh, he was a huge and fierce supporter. He was my Stanford colleague, but a fierce supporter of plugged in. So he would bring us over periodically, but he was a fraternity brother. He was an Omega. And now he's running a tech company in, uh, in, in the UK. So, um, so we are family. We consider our fam ourselves a family of East Palo Alto for many, many years. And only in 2002 did we buy a home here for our first time and make East Palo Alto our home. Um, as a young adult, I continue to work in service to the city. And, uh, I, I appreciate uh, Miss Ophelia raising Romic because uh, while my husband and I were then and are still now engineers uh, who were working in the high tech industry, we definitely identified with the work that Yuka was doing at that time. And although we were working late nights and doing everything that we had to do for our jobs, we thought that the one way that we could play a role was to help to fund meals for those who were organizing. And so that was the role that we helped to play with, with Romic and with, uh, with Yuka. <coughs> My first act beyond service was the act of political organizing um, that Uncle Bob mentioned. And um, that for me was a really critical juncture because I was a very, very early supporter of, at the time, Senator Obama. And um, I, I was an early dissenter from my family who were uh, supporters of others initially who had um, stronger uh, known names in our family. And my husband and I were even at odds, and he was from Illinois. Um, and, and I felt very strongly that uh, there was work that I could do to activate our network inside of East Palo Alto. And so I went to uh, the campaign and I said, I want to be a field organizer for you. And they said, where do you live? And I said, East Palo Alto. And they said, well, we've not been able to get um, an organizing entity established in East Palo Alto. And we're not sure that you can either. But try it out. And um, if you're successful at it, then, then, then we'll support your ask. Uh, and so I remember at that time, I called a bunch of elders. I talked to Mavis Knox, who is now deceased. She gave me the names of uh, Uncle Bob or Bob Hoover at the time. She gave me uh, Dr. Omo Satterwhite. She gave me the Rages. She gave me uh, the, High, the Highlands. She gave me all of these lovely names, many of whom are sitting in this room. And together, we launched a team. I think we had a first kickoff meeting at my house, and they were like, we have no idea who you are, but, but Mavis says you're interesting, and so we'll at least listen for a few minutes. And, um, and, so, uh, and so there launched, launched our work, and I went back to the campaign, and I said, look, we, like, we've got a team. We've got a house. We've got a team. We're phone banking. We're doing, you know, we're doing all these things. The campaign said, OK, well, that's new. Um, let, let, let's make you an East Palo Alto neighborhood team leader. And so they did. And we kicked off a big event at the park and did a bunch of fun stuff. And it got so interesting for them that they had to send people down because they weren't exactly sure what was going on in the city of East Palo Alto. But ultimately, they gave me a regional field organizing role. And I ended up having responsibility all the way down to Gilroy and then from Monterey all the way over to Monterey and then to Fremont on this side. So it was quite an interesting region. And of course, the state of California was very firmly for President Obama. But uh, we transported a lot of human capital across borders by phone banking and other things. And that, uh, that for me, forged a really special relationship with a lot of special people in this room that continue to mentor and support uh, me um, through that time, who continued to make a dynamic uh, footprint and imprint on that campaign, um, so much so that when I came back and said, there's a difference that I want to make in this city, that's exactly where I started. Um, asking for permission in many ways, asking for guidance in many ways, um, and also sharing a perspective on 
um, where I thought I could contribute in a uniquely different way um, to the city than had previously been contributed. And once I secured the blessing of these elders, um, that's how I proceeded. So from my perspective, um, one thing that I knew then uh, that is even more clear now is that the demographics of the city are changing very, very rapidly. In fact, when I uh, ran for office in November of last year, it was true then that 25% of the residents that were uh, there at that time had not been there just four years ago. And that, that's not necessarily um, gentrification, uh, it's just change. And so can I just do a bookmark on gentrification and ask of you, uh, we talk about gentrification a lot as a way of displacing um, residents that are here. I want to make a plea to you, particularly for those of us that are of color, to think of us in a different way. Because for a person of color who has chosen to move to the city of East Palo Alto, it is likely because they are just one generation away from not having very much. Those, those children who um, grew up with silver spoons in their mouths do not choose East Palo Alto to live. So when we choose to be here, it is because we are choosing to be in a community that feels like family. It's because we're choosing to uh, relate to our elders in the same way that we relate to our elders where we came from. And it is also because we choose uh, to reinvest in the communities that look just like ours and make just look just like the communities that we were raised in and make them even better. Now, so, so please embrace us because I want to make a plea later that we ought to welcome a whole lot of those folks back who are here working in tech and think of them not as organs that we're waiting to reject at any point in time, but think of them as a natural part of the ecosystem that makes us great as a people and that makes us great as a community. That's my first ask. When I think about the challenges that um, I am, um, that, that we as electeds are working through um, and that we as a room ought to consider together, um, one is that we have to balance our housing strategy. And before I get into that, let me just scroll down a little bit and talk to you about the values that I use when I think about our agenda. The first is that permanence only comes with ownership. We fool ourselves if we believe that just placing a roof over our heads for now is a way of ensuring that we create a sense of permanence for us now and in the future. And so anything that we do with respect to housing has got to include a path to ownership yeah. for more of us. Yeah. Or we have no sense of permanence and we shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking anything that we're saying. The second is that inclusion comes with our own sense of intellect and engagement. And that means that we have to be just as serious at being at the table and knowing our numbers and knowing what outcomes we are really driving toward as everyone else, or else we will be overlooked. That matters to me. It's got to matter to all of us. Mm -hmm. And the third thing is that with progress comes responsibility. So I am 45 years old. I am exactly 10 years older than the city of East Palo Alto. I consider myself to be a middle-aged adult, and I consider the city of East Palo Alto to be leaving its young adult years and moving into its full-fledgling state as an adult. And for those of us that are here, it means that we have to own that with a sense of total responsibility, total ownership, total engagement. We've got to be in it all the way. So I'll go back to the things that, um, that I think um, are particularly interesting and important for us to grapple with as policymakers, as electeds, and as people. The first is we have to balance our housing strategy. We have just about 7,500 units, housing units in the city of East Palo Alto, a third of which are apartments, two thirds of which are homes. Uh, so let's just say, like for simple math, because I love math, let's say 2,500 of them are apartments and 5,000 of them are homes. 
Of those homes, about 1,800 of them are owner-occupied, and the remainder are rented. So when we talk about displacement, that's where the real risk is, in those 3,200 homes that are rented, because at the moment, we have not one policy that protects tenants of those homes from being displaced by increased rents. And that is where the displacement largely is occurring. That's number one. As we think about our housing strategy, sure, we can take the straightforward path, which is to create a lot of apartments for people to live in because it does create a roof over their heads. But again, going back to the value, it does not create permanence. Permanence comes with ownership. So you should be putting a tremendous amount of pressure on us to create those paths for ownership because that's how we keep us in the room. The second thing is a careful approach to development. Again, I watched the numbers. The numbers say that if we do nothing, if we just sit on our hands today, by 2021, our revenues will be outpaced by our costs as a city. That's the real truth. In two years. In two years, if we do nothing and sit on our hands. Now, where we've got a firm forward stance is, is, is in adding more affordable housing units, largely rental units, but more affordable housing units. And where we have a firm forward stance is in development. But when you think about a city and the health of a city, that doesn't come with tall corporate buildings and affordable apartments. There's more that makes a city. We've got to think about, as Stephen said, where are we eating? We've got to think about where are we putting our kids in school? We've got to think about a, a ton of things beyond that. And we also, as we think about our development efforts, need to be asking for things that account for account for all of this. So when we look at, for example, traffic, we can't just ask for traffic mitigation. Right now, East Palo Alto is a parking lot. If we build a five or six or seven or eight story building, and by the way, the taxes that come from that are taxes that we need, because I said, as I said, if we do nothing, our costs will outpace our revenue, so we have to do something, but, that's right, but, it's not enough to just say mitigate the additional traffic because we're already a parking lot. So the additional ask is what can we do to end, what, end this problem that we have? What are the transportation commissions that we can get some of our developers on? What are the subsidies? What are the policies? What are the ordinances? What are the other things that we can do to help us as a city not be victim to the parking lot that has now been created in our backyard as people try to get here, there, and everywhere. It's a huge policy concern. We also have about $160 million of deferred infrastructure. So someone mentioned earlier, um, our roads look better than they used to look. That is true. And yet, if you drive through most of our roads, they are cracking. Right? They puddle up very easily. All of that is deferred infrastructure that we are not paying down as aggressively as I would like us to. And again, if we sit on our hands and do nothing, we won't be paying very much of it off at all because our costs are going to start outpacing our revenue. That's important. Next, ensuring that our city remains safe. The last time that I looked at our budget, uh, the police force was still about 60% of our budget. In most cities, that number is between 15 to 40%, so it's a relatively large portion of our city budget. Now, that's still only 38 police officers. It's not a huge force, right? Um, and I, those of you who are in, uh, actively engaging in East Palo Alto neighbors, I remember looking at East Palo Alto neighbors on the 4th of July, and it was like a civil war broke out. Everybody wanted to know one of two things. One was, why are we doing this? Because this is illegal. 
right? So, so there was a, clearly 50% of East Palo Alto neighbors that were saying that, and the other 50% was saying, laws? What laws? This is fun, let the children have fun, right? Um, but in the, in the center of it was, where are the police officers and why aren't they helping us to manage this? And frankly, on that night, we had staffed three times more officers than we staff on any other night. And on that night, there were nine times more calls than, than any other night. And so even in our best day, we would have not had enough officers on the street to address those issues, right? So, um, and as I talked to, and as the mayor talked to the commander and others about what was going on, what was their response? Well, we also have some real crimes that we're solving tonight. There's not that many of us, right? So there is some work that we need to do um, as a city to help make sure that we balance um, our focus on safety and also recognize that it's at the, at the moment still a huge part of our budget as a city. Um, the one that I'm particularly passionate about, and I know that we have school board members that I would um, all things equal, prefer to also be at, up here on the stage, is we've got 12,000 kids in the city of East Palo Alto. And I talked about a value that my parents had, we'll eat beans so that you be well. I'm not sure that we have a true sense of what's happening with our 12,000 children from birth to the age of 18. Now in K through eight alone, Ravenswood School only touches 32% of our kids. 32% of our kids, 10 years ago, that number was 65%. Which means that it's not even as simple as building an alliance with Ravenswood School District, right? Because the majority of our kids are actually outside of the school district. And there is no one way to understand what the disposition of our children are because they're splintered everywhere, right? They're splintered across Tinsley. They're splintered across charter schools in the city. They're splintered across private and parochial schools. And then we've got Ravenswood in there as well. And that's just K through eight. High school, it becomes an even more splintered outlook, right? At the end of the day, we've got to be the family that says we will eat beans until our children are well. And we've got 12,000 of them. And I'm not sure we've got a good position on it. <clears throat> I also have noted here three other things look after our elders, many of whom we're celebrating with in this reunion. Some of our elders are losing their homes at the fastest rate that I've ever seen. And part of that is because of upside down loans and part of it is because it is expensive to live in the valley and social security is not enough. And part of it is because lack of financial planning, and part of it is because predatory lenders and loaners and everything else, and at the end of the day, if they are not well, we're not well either. These are the people who have paved the way for us and who we owe some care, some support, and some consideration. Then the final two things that I'll say are this. I am an engineer. Someone spoke earlier of Facebook being uh, an imposter, I can't remember the word exactly that you used. I worked for Facebook for a couple of years. I never thought of myself as an imposter, but I'm going to process that when I go home. Um, I think that if Measure C was about minimizing crime in the city, that we need a new measure that focuses on amplifying steam and particularly tech in the city. In this day and age, a child is receiving 100 to 300 hours of tech exposure a year. A year. These same children are the children that will accelerate on into university, and we will put our children in the race, and they will not have received even a fraction of that. Now, I do applaud, I love, like the organization that I love and would probably give my life for is Street Code. But I said we've got 12,000 kids in this city and Street Code touches many hundreds, which means that we've got thousands and thousands and thousands of children that we cannot answer for. 
We need to answer for that in a way that has us eating beans until we know that the next generation doesn't stand at the door and say we're not included. We need to make sure that we've done everything that we can to make sure that they are included because part of that is it, it's not all in our control by any means. I look at my husband, I look at myself, and he's been at Apple for 30 years as an engineer, and I've been all through the tech community. And I said we came from nothing. Part of it is we do owe it to ourselves to equip our children with a fighting chance. And if we're asleep at the wheel together, it's our fault too. Mm -hmm. So the final thing I will say, oh, thank you for that. The final thing I will say is we own the shifting of our narrative. This is our narrative to own. It's our narrative to shape. It is our narrative to project onto the rest of Silicon Valley. You will laugh because in 2002 when I moved here naively, I said, why are we called East Palo Alto? We should be called Bayshore. Bay, we live, like, we're right here on the Bay Wetlands. This is something that is uniquely special for our city. Like, why are we calling ourselves an appendage to another city that's in a different county with different governing rules? Why can't we have our own name? And I was quietly shut down, but I assert in 2019, <laughs> In 2019, we own our own narrative. This is the gateway to Silicon Valley. This is the gateway to diversity and inclusion. This is the gateway to innovation. And we owe it to ourselves to double down on making that investment in ourselves and in our children. I'm gonna invite you to eat beans with me. Let's eat beans together to make sure that 25 years from now, our children are not sitting here saying, Someone had the opportunity to make a better life for me and they didn't do it, right? Let's be these people together who make a difference. on the board when we're talking about the Dunbar Rail. When we talk about traffic in our city, there's a conversation that's taking place about reactivating that rail spur out mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. and bringing a rail across. But East Palo Alto is not a part of the conversation for a stop, and we need to make sure we have somebody represented on the Dunbar Rail quarter study so that if that, if that rail does happen, which I think will help our, our streets tremendously, if we have a rail that will come across the water and take people to the train station in Redwood City, but we need to be a part of that conversation to make sure we know what's going on. Again, the current conversation is to bypass East Palo Alto yet, yet again and have a stop in Menlo Park. We can't allow that. No, no, no. Thanks. No. Thanks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's a. I have another solution, and that is um, it goes along with that, and we are part of the conversation. And that is the southern access route. If they can re do, if they can reactivate the rail, there's enough corporate money to do the southern access route and all of that traffic that comes from San, Santa Clara County and those businesses there, they can do the public-private partnership that's being done by Facebook. So we can have it all, and then it can bypass my community. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Bellhaven Memo Park. <laughs> we got a traffic problem too. Yeah. So let me um, say that um, we've heard from all of these panel members uh, a lot of information about what the current situation is, kind of what the major issues are, and some ideas about how we might attack them. But all of that is useless if we don't have the people to do the work. And by the work, I mean all the research that needs to be done, uh, looking at all the data, figuring out things like where does the revenue come from to do these things. A lot of cities, I've talked to um, Regina about this before and some other people, but a lot of cities, when they have these kind of major uh, 
sometimes generational issues, they create special task forces and give them the responsibility for dealing with that one issue and doing all of the things that needs to be done to come up with a solution and then make a recommendation back to the, to the council. Certainly the council with this, our council with five people and a limited staff in terms of professional staff people just are not enough people to do all the work that needs to be done. So uh, I think we need to, one is to uh, utilize the intellect that's within the community, but also Stanford University, uh, Santa Clara University, San Jose State, we've got three major universities within 20 miles of us. And they have departments that deal with these kinds of issues. We ought to be forming partnerships with them and working out ways to engage and bring those resources into our community and help us to figure out how to solve these problems. So, uh, as I said, I've talked with this about several members of the council and people who also at the county level, but uh, I just think that given the fact that we're sitting in the middle of not only the wealthiest uh, area in the country, but also one of the most intelligent, intellectual, and hum tremendous resources, not to mention adding the corporate world, uh, Google and Facebook, I think we need to be working at creating tight partnerships with them and, and trying to bring all those resources to bear. So uh, in terms of the task forces, we certainly have people in this community who are capable of doing some of the things that we're talking about. And that's why you ain't going nowhere. You're going to keep on working. I know you ain't going to say to me, but you are going to keep on working. Wait a minute. No, I'm not. Stephen that said something about passing the baton. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's gonna go all and I'm just saying that you, that you, you have, have to hold it to pass. <laughs> Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, 
on the table. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier that I was in a meeting a uh, few weeks ago with 30 students from this community that are in college right now. They're all home for the summer. And there's a total of 60 that, are, that I know of that we have contact with on a regular basis who are in college, some many of them close to graduation, and we need to be utilizing those young people as a part of the group that we're talking about passing the bond, baton to. But the problem, the, there's a disconnect. Those kids are in school, but we don't have a mechanism for bringing them back and engaging them, even while they're here this summer. Engaging them in the kinds of issues that we're talking about right now. And I think that's one way that we start. But the other one is uh, to identify people within the community who are, willing to be, who, who are willing to get involved in this process of trying to bring solutions for the problems. Certainly five people on the council can't do it, and the, and the current city staff can't do it alone. Uh, I'm going to... Uncle Bob, can I highlight yes, one other sure. thing? One of the things that we are trying to do in East Palo Alto, um, in 2015, the city took up My Brother's Keeper, which was Barack Obama, President Barack Obama's initiative, which is to change outcomes for our young men and boys of color. Right now, we need some help to get this initiative really kicked off and going. And I'm gonna tell you the six things that are important. Number one, we need to make sure our kids are entering school ready to learn. Two, the initiative states that they should be reading at third grade level by the end of third grade. And I know everybody in this room understands the importance of that and what it's gonna do, the significance to make sure that they're, uh, three is to, uh, that they're graduating from high school. Four, that they're going to college. Five is that they have um, job opportunities once they're done. And number six, for our individuals who have gotten into trouble, let's give them a second chance and make sure that we're supporting the whole child all around. Right now, we're, we have a pilot program that's taking place in East Palo Alto where we're working about, we're doing a, we want to kick off a community-wide literacy program, but there's a pilot program that's going to work with some of our young people, and it's taking place, I believe, at the Muhammad Ali Center. They, they tested them early. They're going to work with them every day to increase their literacy score and their reading scores to see if we can make a difference and change the outcomes because we know that our children are falling behind in their reading scores within our school district. So as a group, if we can come together and kind of figure out how do we mentor our young people, how do we help them with their reading, and how do we make a difference there. The next thing I'm going to say is I work for an education tech company. I'm the government affairs manager for study.com. We need to make sure we're at the table when we bring opportunities. Study.com brought the opportunity for a no cost to the student bachelor's degree pathway and we were not at the table and I want to make sure when it comes back that enough of us are at the table to take on this opportunity where you can earn a bachelor's degree in data analytics, computer science, psychology, healthcare management. Um, there are a wide range of degrees but we need to make sure that we're there. You can get a degree and not have any student debt when it's said and done. That is going to be important. And then the next thing that I know that's going on in the Bay Area, um, in, in East Palo Alto, there is a free business and data analytics class that's taking place in the collaboration of SB Silicon Valley Bank and Kenyatta College. The class takes place on Wednesdays from 6 to 8 at Job Train, and then you do, you do your coursework um, online on Sunday. But by the time you're done with the 16-week course, you can go into an entry-level data analytics uh, job. We need to improve the communication to make sure that everybody is aware of these opportunities so the opportunities are not passing us by. And if we really want to give our young people an opportunity to stay in their community, they need these opportunities to get jobs that are going to that will increase their economic mobility. Please Thank add you. that they must okay. be able to pass the notions and, get, and teaching them all of it if they can't pass the test. And our kids, for a large part, do not pass the test. We need to teach them how to test. Let me. Hold on one second. I want us to um, come out of this session with some, at least, what is the one, what is the next step, if it's next week or whatever, how do we begin to move from where we are to a more uh, inclusive effort at resolving and dealing with our issues, and we don't just have 
people making suggestions about what we ought to do, but actually have a way forward. So um, there are a couple of people in here that are kind of experts in this, but one of the things I would like to ask is that if we could have some kind of engagement with one or two council members <coughs> and, and pick a, a couple of other people or organizations that ought to be a part of that, and those conversations would be almost exclusively around what we're talking about now. Current situations and how do we utilize, how do we find the resources to resolve those situations. So uh, if, we, if we could, and we have the mayor and vice mayor here. Well, we uh, have you two councilmen. <laughs> All appointments happen by the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> <laughs> two, two is okay. Two is okay. Uh, so to, and then from that would would really kind of define where do we go from there. So I'm just saying that that would be the first step, and then that first step is to try to figure out where do we go from there, and how do we bring the the resources within the community and also the resources that are outside of the community to bear on, on these issues. <clears throat>